So here we are with uh, Community of Writers, and we've got Eric Aldrich, who is the department head of writing at downtown campus. Why am I looking over there? He is... <laughs> Um, he's a fiction writer, writes essays, uh, originally from central Massachusetts. He's got lots of wonderful publications, and you can find them all at ericaldrich.net. You can see he's got uh, a bunch of short stories that are published. He has a novella that's coming forth soon, and you're going to be hearing from some of these stories as we go along. And he also has a good number of reviews of different books and some great publications, mostly uh, Heavy Feather Review, Full Stop, Terrain, and others. So that's his uh, street creds. And before <laughs> we go into the questions, I'd love to start just with your with your fiction and your craft. So if you would be willing to read from um, Ponderosa, which is published in uh, Manifest West, which is a literary fiction collection of wonderful stories. And um, my one line, it's the ending of it, my one line summary of this story is man loses way with his dog in Ponderosa Forest and wonders about his relationship with his wife and dispels his doubts or comes to new understanding by the end of the story. But if you want to <laughs> set it up <laughs> and read the ending, that would be great. Sure. So um, just this is a story that takes place on, on the Mogollon Rim here in Arizona. Um, in order to write the story, uh, the story is about a guy who's questioning his relationship with his wife. Um, however, in order to write the story, my wife and I actually found a map and went and drove to the middle of the forest. And we had a compass and a GPS. Um, and we just walked around for hours to kind of simulate what the character would go through. Um, and it's beautiful, beautiful up there. It's inspiring. Um, as a landscape, it is kind of interesting because there's just pine trees at some spots as far as your eye can see. There's no horizon. Um, and it's, it's a special, it's a special place. We should probably go check it out before it burns down as the rest of Arizona has been doing recently. Night way to start it off like a downer, but everything's going to burn down. <laughs> All right, I'll read now. <laughs> so in the story, Philip has been, the main character has been chasing s something that he sees in the forest that he's not sure is a person or not. Um, he's been imagining it's a person. But um, this is the point where he finds out what it really is. And he has a dog named Osa. I think Osa is mentioned in that passage. Yes, he has a so. dog with him named Osa. Okay, cool. Right. Uh, Philip crumpled the balloon and stuffed it in the Y of a split trunk aspen. Had he ever really believed it was the purple backpack on a woman ahead of him in the, this trailless, featureless forest? Somehow he was less surprised to find the balloon than he would have been to find another human being. He wanted someone to be there. It was shameful to be lost and let a fantasy overtake him, but that was what he had done. <clears throat> he should have stayed close to his last known location, set a signal fire, toggled the GPS. Instead, he chased a mirage and psychoanalyzed pines. Could the Ponderosa do that? Could a pine deceive itself or another or lie to the forest? Or was the forest something greater, like whatever part of Philip that knew the truth all along, the part that made him admit to himself, that he had allowed himself to get lost, that he wanted to get lost, maybe to prove to himself that people would let him get lost, or maybe to test what disconnection would feel like. But there in the aspen grove, after hours of endless brown needles, after hours of walking, of fretting, of missing Iris, that's his wife, and his family, after the mistletoe and the burn damage, after the lost blazes and the vanishing stream, after following a goddamn balloon, Philip hoisted himself into the branches to climb the Douglas fir, <clears throat> a Douglas fir. Short live needles stuck his skin. They lined the twigs like teeth on saw blades. Dead branches intermixed with live ones as he clawed his way upward, stick by stick. Where the bark fell off dead branches, intricate tattoos of beetle tunnels swirled in the wood. Philip noticed that this tree was also infected with yellow claws of mistletoe. Limbs snapped and creaked as he ascended, his hands bled from sharp sticks and needles. Branches grew thinner as he went higher. The trunk swayed. Finally, Philip steadied himself, secured his footing, and caught his breath. Miles to the south, sunset reddened thunderhead stretching the horizon where the sky crashed against the Mogollon Rim. Closer to the west, a clean-cut line of high-tension wires blazed a scar through the trees. Don't worry, Philip sent the thought across the horizon to Iris and Palm Springs. Don't worry, he pictured Osa on her blanket below. As he descended, he plucked the mistletoe within his reach, dropped them down to wither on the ground. 
He did it on behalf of that solitary fir, because it wasn't alone. It had the aspen, and even if they had to always stand just a little bit apart, in their mingled roots, they had each other. <laughs> I love that. I love that ending, too. It's just the mingled roots and that um, conflation of nature, nature as a way of explaining this, what that phrase that I love, to test what disconnection feels like or connection. Sure. Well, yeah. so, so pine trees, ponderosa pine and other types of trees, there are bacteria and fungus that live in the soils and they form connections between the roots of different trees, sometimes even different trees of, of different species. Mm. It's a symbiotic relationship. Um, and so you do kind of have to wonder how the trees are aware of each other, what their awareness is like, what their time f scale they live on is. Um, we don't really understand that much about forests and, and trees as, as organisms, though a lot of people are, are doing research on that. So in a sense, this is actually somewhat a science fiction story uh, because the science is, is about trees, it's, it's ecology, and it's sort of questioning how they can be a mirror for our own sort of neuroscience and the ways that we're coming to understand the physicality of our consciousness as well. Right, and communication too, yeah. the way these, these organisms communicate when we, we always say, oh, humans, we're humans because of communication. And right. I think that ignores the ways that every single sentient thing communicates. Yeah. I mean, most things communicate with chemicals and bioluminescence is the most widely spoken language on earth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to speak it, but maybe <laughs> Google Translate will help. I don't. You need know. a glow stick. I need a glow stick. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and an audience of fireflies. I'm getting one. <laughs> I'm right. gonna get one. <laughs> well, thank you for reading that. And um, I mean, I remember reading it before and just being so impressed with all of the research because it was fascinating to me. I didn't know anything about how mistletoe worked and all that mm. stuff. So, really, really interesting stuff. And so, I love your descriptions of nature, and that leads me to my first question, which is. Um, your short stories are informed by at least two geographies, uh, Massachusetts, you're from central Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and the southwest, uh, mostly Tucson, but more areas in the southwest. And the working title of your first collection of stories, so you've put together a collection of stories which will be published soon, I'm sure, and it's called <laughs> Swamp Yankee. Um, so could you talk about that term and then also about these, I mean, these are radically different landscapes, and yet you write stories that... Are, are set in both and are, uh, your writing is comfortable in both landscapes. So of course the, the obvious answer is that that's where I've lived, right? So, um, but a Swamp Yankee is an actual designation. It's a, it's a subculture and it's a dialect uh, in a certain part of New England. Um, and so I actually have a couple descriptions of Swamp Yankees and I'm going to read them. Um, <laughs> this first one is by uh, Ruth, Ruth Shell, and it was published in American Speech, the, the journal American Speech in May 1963. Um, it says the term Swamp Yankee may be defined as, quote, a rural New Englander dweller who abides today as a steadfast rustic and who is of Yankee stock that has endured in the New England area since the colonial days. Um, it goes on to say, the real swamp Yankee is not much for the gay lights and rackets of the cities. He prefers his quiet swamp. <laughs> That's one definition of swamp Yankee. Uh, this is the definition of swamp Yankee from Urban Dictionary. Uh, a New, New England trailer trash or northern redneck. I don't really <laughs> prefer the term trailer trash, but this is from Urban Dictionary. Mm -hmm. uh, someone whose family has been in America for generations several of which may actually reside together, but has never gotten off the ground couch or smack long enough to build a functional family or become a redeeming member of society. Um, and the, the sentence that Urban Dictionary provides is, I immediately noticed the unmistakable scent of pot after the Swamp Yankee drove by me in his rusty Dodge Monaco with a rotting muffler. <laughs> <laughs> Having been in New England my whole life, I don't see too many Dodge Monacos. Unlike the Southwest, if we're talking about differences in landscape, um, all the Dodge Monacos succumbed to body rot from too much salt in the winter in mm -hmm. New England a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But the idea here is that a Swamp Yankee is a rural person from New England who stays rural. Um, and I use that term because my dad used that term. And um, I do sort of identify with it. <laughs> I do feel like a Swamp Yankee. Um, but the thing that sort of maybe directed me to the Southwest was that New England is overpopulated now. The population density where I'm from has absolutely skyrocketed. And it's not that I don't like to be around people, but I kind of don't really like to be around too many people, 
particularly when we're all trying to drive down a windy little road in our own car so that there's 35 people in a line trying to get through one stop sign. Um, I guess that's kind of what Tucson's like. But outside of the city, there's the beautiful desert, there's the expanse of land, there's places where you can get away from people. And, and I don't mean that in a misanthropic way, but there is something psychologically beneficial, I think, from a little bit of solitude or time with a limited number of people of your choice, particularly if you get to spend that time in nature. Um, and the Southwest offers nature and access to nature in a way that places in the country that have a longer colonial history don't anymore. Um, you know, you can go camping just on the side of a forest road somewhere south of here in an hour. Just find a spot, you pay nothing, you see no one for days. In New England, that same thing would cost you $20 and there'd be, you know, 75 other families around you with screaming children and loud music and generators. Mm -hmm. So I do feel the connection to my home, right? But I kind of, this is my adopted, my adopted home. And so the, the difference that I notice in my writing when I write about each place is sort of a, an element of setting <clears throat> and a reflection of the landscape where in New England, I often tend to write more about stories that are interpersonal relationships. And in the Southwest, I often find that my characters are like Philip and Ponderosa and some other ones. Um, they're, they're using the setting as, as a form of, of insulation or, or isolation from, from large groups of people. Um, and so the desert becomes their, their refuge in right. that way. Right. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. I, I like that. That's, uh, um, so here's an obnoxious academic question. Great. Um, <laughs> cause I know you like those. Um, sure. if I were to apply a central question from eco criticism, so we just talked about this a little bit cause, uh, because, uh, in my Southwestern lit course, we, we read your story, uh, a heliograph to Ken Kletso just yes. this past Tuesday. Um, but, so the question from eco-criticism is, so how is nature, and you can ignore any part of it that, this, that you want, <laughs> how is nature rep represented in your work? That's a big one. But I like this one a little bit better, and it's straight from Purdue Owl. I didn't make it up. Um, how is nature empowered or oppressed? Interesting questions. Um, so I think that nature in my work is... And this may be something that I haven't been asked before. And it's really interesting when you have a question like that, because sometimes it's an opportunity to be kind of self-critical, where I'm not always sure if nature stands alone or if I tend to think of nature as some sort of a reflection or metaphor for people. Um, that's certainly, you know, in Ponderosa, that, that's what it is. Though I do think that seeing how we are reflected in nature and nature is reflected in us does do something to break down the idea that there's a real separation between us and nature. Um, we can draw a super superficial separation between civilization, nature, urbanization, all these things. But if you burn down nature, if you screw up the balance of the gases in the atmosphere, if you kill all the animals in a certain ecosystem or even just one animal in an ecosystem, you can potentially set off an effect where we are heavily affected. And even in the safety of our cities, even behind the barrier of our technology, we're still at the mercy of nature. I'm, I'm thinking of the unfortunate people in Nashville who just got hit by a, by a tornado. Mm -hmm. um, we're, I'm thinking about all the people who are coming down with coronavirus, right? Our, our civilization has a, an artificial idea that there's a barrier between itself and, and nature. Um, but really, we're, we're fully susceptible to, the, to nature in a way that nature is only partially susceptible to us. Mm. We can damage it a little bit. We can damage it quite a bit. But ultimately, we're the ones who are going to suffer the, the outcome of that damage that we've done to nature. Mm -hmm. So we can't really think of ourselves as, as separate. And like nature is, is a, a concept that's separate from ourselves. Oh, I have a hobby. I like to go out in nature. Oh, I, I enjoy nature. That's fine if you feel that way. That's a great way to feel. Um, but you have to think a little bit more that you don't go out to nature. You're in nature all the time and you can get away from evidence of civilization, but you can never get away from evidence of nature. Look at all the crane flies in our house around Tucson oh, I know, this season, right? right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I think that when I think about this from, um, I don't, I don't remember the second part of your question, honestly. Um, uh. Empowered or oppressed. I think it was all smushed, to, smushed together. Nature represented in your work. You, that, you just did sure. that beautifully. And um, I think I think you already answered the okay. empowered or repressed, oppressed. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was great. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think that nature can't really be oppressed. It can only be damaged in ways that come back to hurt us. Mm-hmm. Right. Cool. All righty. Um, so we'll just slide into a heliograph to Ken Klutzo. And um, I do have some student questions. There are actually a lot. So oh, well. <laughs> I don't know if you want to, do you want to read first and then get the questions or get the questions first? Um, well, I may as well read first. So if someone is watching this, then they have a little bit of uh, context. context. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'll give you a little background for this story. Uh, a few years ago, uh, my wife found that you can go and watch the, the winter solstice at Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. Chaco Canyon is an ancestral Puebloan site. Um, if, if someone has not been there, I highly suggest making the trip out. Um, it will change your idea about pre-Columbian architecture. Uh, I would say Mesa Verde would also change your ideas about pre-Columbian architecture. Mm. But Ken Kletzo did a lot to make me think about the really the level of sophistication that people were living at in the Southwest prior to colonization. Mm. Um, well, one of the th- elements that these people who had lived there had built into their architecture was that they aligned their structures with solstices and other astronomical events. Mm. And so on the winter solstice, if you stand at the corner of the house that we now call Kin Kletso, there's no evidence that the people who built it called it that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you stand at one corner of the house, there's a cleft in a peak uh, opposite to this corner of the house. And on the solstice, the sun rises perfectly in line with this cleft. So we drove out there and checked it out. Um, and it was it was really pretty amazing. Uh, and we got to walk around the the whole site early in the morning with almost no one else there. Someone is watching this now. They figured out that I like to be at places alone <laughs> <laughs> or the limited number of other people. Right. Though actually, while we watched the sunrise, we were in a crowd of people. And that was sort of empowering and nice because everyone was experiencing this thing together, even though we didn't know each other. It was like we all had this common idea. We all wanted to be here. We all made a huge effort to get out to the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. at five o'clock in the morning in the middle of December. And so we did even there was kind of a large group watching the the sunrise and cool. it was some solidarity between the people there. Um, so this is just a, a section where the ranger who was act, this is sort of what actually happened. The ranger was telling us about the event and the, the location. Okay. So this is the ranger is speaking at the beginning um, from stories told in Native American cultures that came after the Anasazi. The ranger continued. Some scholars believe the Chacoans spent the night before the winter solstice in prayer and ritual, adding their spiritual strength to the forces of light that almost succumbed to the dark on the day, the year's shortest day. Carter wondered if the Chacoans ever skipped the ritual, like everybody had the flu or something, and maybe they noticed that the sun arrived without, the, without their help. Violet would scold him for saying that, accuse him of trying to extinguish magic. The sun hadn't emerged from the solstice notch yet, but it was bright enough for him to see red noses and flushed cheeks as he rode through the group. Some people caught him looking at them. Carter smiled, something he had learned from Violet, and people smiled back. Some said, good morning. Where was Violet? Was she still in Telluride, confiding to whoever she was with about the man who used to love her, who still loved her enough to arrive at Chaco Canyon before sunrise? Was she broken down somewhere on the prairie, on the Indian access route that led to the ruins? Did she oversleep? Was she sick, hurt? Did she have second thoughts about seeing him again? Tell herself she just couldn't do it? Regret missing the solstice, regret inviting him, and spoiling it for herself. Mm, Great. Okay, so this is, to me, this is another example of the relationship in the story being so tightly woven into the landscape. And so my students, when they were, when they were reading it, um, were re- very interested in this relationship. So Violet is the woman who's 10 years older than Carter, who's mm. the main character. And um, they've been apart for six years. She moved to Vancouver, and he saw her on Facebook, and, and they said, well, let's just meet here. Yeah. And she never shows, right? right? So here are the questions. I'm just going to throw them out. There's quite a few, so just pick what, <laughs> okay, pick what works for you. But Savannah Carlson asks, um, I'm curious as to what Violet's intentions. The other thing is it's kind of cool to talk about these questions because they want all this information. So it might be a way to talk about what you include and what you sure. leave out in a short sure. story. Um, I'm curious as to what Violet's intentions are with him and what she's trying to accomplish. I really want to know what happened while the two were together and what adventures they went on. I also want to know Violet's story and her own perspective on this matter. Um, and then Zachary Jardy 
says, if I had to ask Eric Aldrich some questions, it would be what inspired this story? And we I've pretty much, yeah. yep, you have answered that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to take place with such descriptive detail of someone's life as they essentially learn to move on, which I thought was cool. What wisdom did he hope to impart on us, the readers, that may be hidden in the lines of the story? And for my final question, um, does the heliograph that appears at the ru- ruin portray what Violet's message for Carter would have been if she had shown up? Like a couple more. Uh, Luciana Contreras asks, my number one question for the author would be if Violet ever gives Carter an explanation as to why she stood him up. And Sarah Rodriguez asks, how did he meet Violet? Did he ever see her speak to her again or get an explanation? Does he still love her? Do you have the mi- Do you still have the meteor right? <laughs> <laughs> and are they still friends on Facebook? <laughs> Well, so in, in the story, uh, Carter and Violet, while they were in a relationship with one another, found a meteorite, and Carter had it cut up into pieces as a gift for her that he never got a chance to give her. Um, having been at the Gem Show recently, I wish I ever had a meteorite like that. They're worth like tens of thousands of dollars. So oh, wow. if you ever find one, give it to me. I'll take good care of it for you. Um, I'm on the downtown campus. You can find me easily. I'll accept pretty much anything of value you bring to me. Um, some of the other questions I thought were really interesting because the story has Violet as a presence who's never actually present. Right. Um, and the only the only language we get from her is on Facebook, right? And then I think they text or something like there's that. There's a little bit of text, and, yeah. and Carter remembers something that she said to him when right. they split up. Right, right, um, yeah. right. And I do think it's interesting that that people have all these questions about about her, that your students focus on her because she is a, a huge presence, right? And her her impact on the, on the main character is what moves him to come to some sort of a of a conclusion. The idea that the the message, the final uh, heliograph, so a heliograph heliography is actually a way that people communicate using mirrors over distances, where they bounce light off the mirrors and they send light over pretty large distances. It's kind of like peniform um, communication, where they use the flags to do okay. something similar. Got it. Um, and so Carter has this idea of heliography uh, because the light, you know, is is coming up on the solstice and it's aligns with the architecture of Kincletso. Right. Um, so I I do I love wh- whichever of your students made the idea that that was the message from from Violet. I love that idea. I haven't thought of it before, but I'm going to pretend like it's my idea now <laughs> because that was a great line. I forget which student said that. I think that, it was Zachary who said thanks, that. Zachary. Yeah, that was great. Um, <laughs> and so, I my idea here was I don't really know. I'm I'm sort of in Carter's head, right? What would what would it feel like to be the guy that shows up to something with that level of anticipation and then have it not really work out? Um, I don't think that the reader can assume that Violet didn't try to get there. Um, I, this, if you know where King Kletso or Chaco Canyon is, it's a long ride. I mean, you, to get there, we ended up staying in Gallup, New Mexico overnight and then getting up at like 4 o'clock in the morning and driving another hour and a half from there to get mm-hmm. to Chaco Canyon pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are potential things that could pretend, make it hard for Violet to, right. to actually get there. So. I don't necessarily think that that character stood him up on purpose, uh, though she could have. Um, it's, it's more about how he learns to react to her absence uh, right. after this long time of, of thinking about her and being separated from her. Um, so it, it's there is a part in the story as well where he, he talks to these two New Englander characters right. <laughs> who, are, who are just me and my wife right. and, uh, and didn't really happen, but it was a way for me to think about the story and put myself in it mm-hmm. so that I could feel more connected to the environment and to the action and the events right. uh, in the story. So wow. I don't have much to reveal about Violet from the story. In in my mind, like as a writer, when you talked about what you include and you don't include, um, I imagine that Violet is a benevolent person who mm-hmm. doesn't hold anything against Carter, who, who likes him for who he is. Right. But in the story that she has some criticisms of him that are that are true 
and they remain true right. throughout the the duration of the story. And maybe at the end is when he realizes that. So. Mm-hmm. And comes to some sort of, yeah, healing yeah. or something like that. I love that when we talk about stories, we talk about these people as if they're like sitting next to us. They're our best <laughs> friends. When, well, when Violet said that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so uh, some of your stories include characters that might be considered misfits or at the edge. Should we do the Hari Kari or should we go on to science fiction? What are you feeling? That's up to you. I don't know. Either way is fine. Um, I'm not sure what our, our timing is, so I do want to make sure that we get... Let's let's do science fiction because I want to make sure that we get to that. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so you write science fiction and you also teach science fiction literature, which is, I would argue, our most popular literature course at Pima. It fills up before it even gets on the schedule, so that's really cool. Um, can you talk about what draws you to science fiction, both writing and reading it, because you're in a group of folks who read science fiction and teaching it? And could you talk about your teaching and, and writing and how they influence each other? Again, this is a pile of questions. <laughs> um, and also, in your science fiction literature course, you ask students to write a science fiction story, I think, I think if you're still doing think, that. Yeah. yeah. And so I was just wondering, uh, what do you learn from this assignment, and what do your students learn from this assignment? So that's all that. Okay. So my working memory isn't my strongest cognitive component, so I'm just going <laughs> to answer what I remember. Cool. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I do teach science fiction. It's Literature 225. Uh, it's always online, though sometime I might teach it on one of the campuses. Um, and I've been doing it for several years. It It is a popular course, so if you, if you want to take it, you kind of have to sign up right around the time of registration. Otherwise, it fills up. It's only an eight-week course. Um, do you think I have my plug for it down? I think I might. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I enjoy teaching the course. I love it. I've made friends from the course, people I still talk to. You mentioned I have a science fiction reading group. That was actually started by someone who took my course. Oh, wow. Um, so there's a community around around that science fiction course. Um, my interest in science fiction is, is lifelong. My dad was a barber. He owned a barber shop. And barbers get subscriptions to magazine services. So he would bring home Popular Mechanics and stuff like that, but particularly he'd bring home Omni Magazine. Uh, I like saying Omni Magazine to people who are old enough to remember what it is <laughs> because cool. their eyes always light up. Omni was an awesome publication, and it's sad that it's gone. Yeah. Um, it was a mixture of science writing and real science fiction. Right. Um, so I've been a science fiction fan forever. I I like the imaginative part of it. Obviously, there's the predictive part of it. Uh, science fiction is science fiction writers are futurists largely, um, though there are some other genres of science fiction that aren't futuristic. But it's a predictive form, uh, and it's and maybe could you explain that a little bit? A predictive form. Sure. Uh, science fiction, in order to be really be science fiction, there's some stuff that's science fiction fantasy, right? Now, that, right. That's, not a, that's not an insult. I love science fiction fantasy, but for example, Star Wars is, is fantasy science fiction. It's a space opera. Um, it took, takes place a long, long time ago in a galaxy far away, and even though there's spaceships and aliens, there's no attempt to really explain anything about them. They just exist. That's the world building. That's the universe. Uh, in that sense, Star Wars is like Lord of the Rings, mm -hmm. right? Um, again, not an insult because Lord of the Rings is amazing, right? But when I'm thinking of science fiction, I'm generally thinking more of what we would call hard science fiction. And hard science fiction, in order to, or even if it's not hard science fiction, it has to be the type of science fiction that starts with some element of, of empiricism, scientific discovery. Uh, I'm thinking of some recent stories that I've taught in my classes uh, from a collection called Future Tense Fiction uh, that look at really contemporary things like using CRISPR DNA to cut starfish DNA into a girl's body to save her from a gymnastics accident. Wow. Uh, that's Maureen McHugh's The Starfish Girl. Mm. Uh, they're very contemporary, those that collection of stories. But science fiction begins um, you know, with a question that has to be grounded in science in some way. And it becomes predictive because you ask how it plays out. Okay. Now, that science doesn't have to be a hard science. Uh, Ted Chang, for instance, in Story of Your Life, the movie, the one that became the movie Arrival, he uses um, uh, linguistics as one of the, right. the sciences that he studies and cognitive linguistics because he's talking about the sapir Whorf hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I understand the science question of science fiction to interpret science fairly broadly. So, for instance, in the 
story, my novella that's coming out from Running Wild Press in the fall um, called uh, Please Listen Carefully as Our Options Have Changed. One of the major sciences in that book is education, and it looks toward the future of, of education. I wish it looked towards a promising future for education, but uh, there's a lot of forces at work, particularly people who are trying to monetize the education space, who try to devalue the relate interpersonal relationship aspect of teaching and education. They think that you can you know, separate the components of teaching and assessment and planning, which isn't really how a class works or be, because building the relationship with your students is a is a crucial part of what it means to be a teacher mm -hmm. um, and people learn from someone who they have a relationship with there's these interpersonal things that technology can't um, actually actually remove right um, so I do sort of see science as being a fairly broad broad term right or category yeah maybe we could just go right into a reading if you could set up this because it's I mean novellas are notoriously hard to publish and yeah. Running Wild Press has these series of novellas and it's wonderful that this one is coming out um, I love this story it's it's very painful um, <laughs> but uh, if you could set it up and then and sure. maybe read so the novella is about a, a fellow named uh, Carlos who is on hold with his subsistence loan company. Uh, I call it a subsistence loan because we call these things student loans, but really people use them to survive while they try to gain an education. And then they're kind of, you know, have this debt, this weight that they carry around. Their education isn't just a gift to them. Right. It's also a curse because they have to carry the weight of this debt around. You know, if they lived in Germany, if they lived in some parts of Europe, if they lived in Canada, if they lived in a whole bunch of other countries that actually value education, um, as a public service, as part of our uh, intellectual and economic infrastructure, which is what education is. It's part of our economic infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it's been pretty significantly devalued in our country yes. by public servants, not, not by students and individuals because there's so many, you know, I think it's 45 million people with crushing student loan debt. Mm -hmm. um, and so Carlos in the future is, is one of these people and the loan has expanded beyond just school. So it's a subsistence loan. He relies on it to survive. And just like our real student loans, it's fairly unnavigatable. Uh, it's extremely impersonal. Um, thanks to some of our very forward-thinking politicians, you can't get rid of it with bankruptcy no matter how bad your life goes. Um, and so a subsistence loan is imagining if we could actually make a student loan even more toxic than they already are. So Ouch. I'll read this part. Okay. This is about Carlos's job. And he's on, he's on the line. Well, he's, I mean, this is yes, like, this well, is clear. <laughs> he's yeah. on the pad, not the line. <laughs> That's old yes, fashioned. <laughs> he's, he's on hold waiting to speak to a representative of his company. And this is what he's thinking about or talking about while he's on hold. Um, so. Carlos is, is doing some work while he's, while he's on hold to pass the time. So it says, to pass the time, he reviews some writing the student overseers collected from their punctuation classes and passed on to the teacher assistants for grading. Instructors review the TA's grades, write up reports, and pass them on to Carlos. Carlos's job is to assess the instructor's reports and provide them with a review of their findings based on the Student Learning Outcome Goals, or SLOGs, of the Punctuation Studies Department. He then forwards his reports to the Director of Punctuation Studies, who assesses his assessment. Based on that assessment, the director recommends areas other than punctuation for Carlos to study in his postdoctoral despecialization degree. These non-punctuation courses are designed to make Carlos less specialized. He recently completed a course on syntax, an adjective seminar, and a pronunciation workshop. Carlos remembers being in high school and falling asleep staring at modular curriculum. Those who show evidence of learning, like Carlos, become eligible for subsistence loans while those who show little academic promise are sent to public housing. So it's important to perform well on the modular curriculum. Many students click through the gamish but not fun multiple choice modules and fill in the answers based on hints provided when someone answers incorrectly. They don't understand how their scores affect their subsistence loan eligibility. If he wasn't good friends with Sally Lee, and if Sally wasn't such an overachiever, who knows, Carlos might have clicked himself into public housing. Though college courses are scripted, at least the punctuation department can modify or experiment with the presentation of the material. College instructors can also coach students. High school teachers would lose their jobs for violating students' rights if they interfered with the curriculum. And though it's pedagogic sacrilege, Carlos secretly believes that students can learn a lot from an engaging lecture. 
The director has scolded Carlos for attracting crowds of interested students by orally presenting information in public spaces. He reminds Carlos that established pedagogic research proves that those students are actually bored, and they will forget the lecture, even if they are listening, taking notes, and asking questions. Part of what we're facing and what I am imagining in this, uh, this sort of dystopic educational future is that our structure of education is not really based around learning. It's a re- based around providing evidence to student loan providers that we're teaching. Um, and it's not that we shouldn't be responsible for teaching. It's not that we shouldn't assess data. It's not that we shouldn't keep data. It's not that we shouldn't use this in our planning and understanding of our, of our teaching. But collecting the data that is evidence that we are teaching successfully has sometimes become an impediment to actually teaching successfully. There's only so many hours in a day. We only have so many neurons in our brains. Our students only have so much patience. And so when our time is taken over with evidence to prove to a student loan administration that we're offering something of value to students, that's very different than listening to students, looking at what their life needs are, and then offering something that actually helps them. They're right. viewed as a commodity or a place to invest, not as an individual who's trying to you know, forward themselves in life and gain something uh, through their education. And so I think that we're sort of at a point in our national dialogue about education where we need to ask ourselves, are we providing people with the ability to move from one class circumstance to another? Are we giving people the opportunity to re-specialize? Are we giving people the opportunity to change their career? You know, our technology moves our economy very quickly. If you run out your student loan eligibility and you, you're still paying off your student loans from your first career and something new comes along that you're hugely interested in and have a lot to offer, and you're like, wow, I could really take this new technology, take this new approach and get into that field and I could be a huge asset to people in that sector. Mm-hmm. Too bad you have you used up your student loan eligibility and you're still paying it off. So our, until we do something about student loan debt and the way that we fund and structure institutions, I mean, I guess we could remind everyone that Pima Community College is one of the only community colleges in the entire nation that receives zero state funding. Mm -hmm. Um, At the time that our state funding was cut, it was like, oh, it's 2008, the budget crisis is going on, the state doesn't have the money. Stocks are at record highs and unemployments are at record lows. Why is the state continuing to say that they don't have the money to invest in our community and Mm -hmm. invest in the education of people in Tucson and Mm -hmm. Maricopa County as well? Um, It's because they don't want to. They want to use that investment somewhere else because they don't value our students. Um, they don't see them as important, and they don't really see the upward mobility in our community as important either. Mm-hmm. Um, even some red states like Tennessee used lottery funding to make community colleges free. So we don't want to politicize this and say this is one party that's neglecting education. This is the, right. this is our state that's neglecting our education because mm-hmm. there are there are more conservative leaning states who have also moved towards really innovative funding models for for funding their public education, funding their community colleges. And right. Arizona's exactly. way behind, unfortunately. Yes, it is. It is unfortunate. And as you were talking, I was really thinking that that's how every everything you were saying I could hear in the story, but just tweaked further. And yeah. it seems like that's a lot of the times what science fiction can do, especially as social critique, mm. is to take the current conditions and then just whack them a little bit, yeah. a little bit more, so then you can look at it and say, oh, wow, we need to pay attention to this. Yeah. That's what I do think science fiction often often does well. You can parody something, you can push it to the point of absurdity, but I don't necessarily think that a subsistence loan is that far away from no, a student loan. I mean, people that are paying back their student loans understand the weight that mm-hmm. is on their back, and right. it's terrible to hear someone who regrets getting an education. That's right. such a That's, incredibly yeah. sad thing. Yeah. Uh, they're, well, my education, I just ended up with loan debt. It's right. like, well, <laughs> that's yeah. not that's not the purpose of education. And let's face it, no previous generations had to put up with this. Mm-hmm. This is a peep, this is a, a tragedy for basically millennials right. and previous generations who say, well, I put myself through college working two jobs. Well, your your credits didn't cost, you know, thousands of dollars. Right. So exactly. it's not the same world. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, and that's why that story is so painful because it's, you know, you can recognize everything is happening now. It's just a little bit further, but it's yeah. painful because it is happening now. It is painful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know where we are on time, but um, I'm going to keep going. Uh, I think I have 
two more questions, kind of. One of them has to do with book reviews, and then another has to do with your process of writing. So I'm not sure which one you want to do. But. I think we probably, from our uh, our queue, have time for one of them. Okay, doke. So we can maybe do the book review one. Uh, yeah, kind of, sort of. Well, you've got all these wonderful book reviews, um, but the, I kind of like the other one, which was <laughs> because you've got a couple novels, and I guess my question was, when do you know something is a short story? When do you know it's a novel? And I'll tell you the book review one anyway, and you get to choose. So the book review one is you've been doing this for over a year now where you've been reviewing a lot of books, and you mentioned Future Tense that you're using in your classes. And so I was just wondering what brought you to the idea of doing book reviews? Um, what does it do for your own writing process? Would you, what do you get out of it? And would you advise other writers to do it? So those sure. are, yeah. I don't really know how I tell the difference between a short story and a novel, except base, basically it's the scope, right? Um, if I have a really huge idea that has many, many components, then it's obviously a novel. If I have a short, like interpersonal situation, um, that it sort of pops into my head. And I almost think of a short story as a puzzle. Like, if this is that way, you know, if, if if this guy is still in love with this woman, but she's not in love with him, but she's a good influence on his life, even though, you know, so I think of this sort of as a puzzle, and then I can create a short story to right. sort of solve that puzzle. Right, yeah. The book reviews are something that I do kind of want to talk about, because if someone's listening to this and they're a writer, um, I would like them, I would like to encourage them to write some book reviews. Uh, you can get free books, which is cool. Um, publishers will just send you their books and you get to review them. Um, it's also a way to know what's going on. Contemporary publishing, what's being published, what's interesting, who's writing, who are the new voices. You get to differentiate between the aesthetics of different presses and different um, styles. Uh, it really lets you know the market, on, so that's a, a helpful thing. It helps you dig, dive deep into other writers who are being successful. And so you can see what they're doing. You can learn from them. You can study their patterns. It, it's a deep way of reading. It's a much deeper way of reading than just reading the text. Because if you've written a close reading essay and you're writing 102 class, you know that you end up sitting with that story. You sit with that text for a long time and you think about it very, very critically. Um, lastly, I would say as a writer, everybody likes to write their own thing, right? And everybody has their creativity that is their outlet and they want to share with the world. And there's a lot of other people doing that, right? And so part of the service element of being a writer is to also remember that you're not the only writer and that you can, by offering other people an outlet and amplifying their work, you are generating benefits for the entire writing community mm -hmm. um, and you just some of this stuff is great I mean the things that I find from doing book reviews are not things that I would normally find if someone just suggested a book to me right. um, so it's always something new it's something different and it's a style that you can learn to write fairly easily mm -hmm. uh, by studying book reviews online read a dozen of them and study the 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 format and the organizational patterns and what book reviews do you don't have to have finished your degree to write a book review. Right. It's immensely difficult to publish a story. It's immensely difficult to publish a poem, and it's even harder to publish a novel. But a book review is not that hard to publish, and it lets you meet the author and talk to the publisher, and it gives you some interaction with editors. Um, it's just a fun way to be involved with, a fun and intellectual way to be involved with the writing community. Yeah, I, I like your point about service. So yeah. that's a wonderful piece of advice for any writers out there. So I think, I think we're probably at the end of this great interview with Eric Aldrich, <laughs> and I hope everybody got some stuff to take home. And this is Community of Writers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.